Larry is. How are you, man? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I've been meeting with marketing people uh, yesterday and today, and it's it's hilarious, man. It's hilarious just to see all the promises they make, and of course, no guarantees. But uh, and you're just laughing because I'm sure you worked with marketing people before. A little bit, you just feel like you're setting your money on fire. Like <laughs> I will set my money on fire in front of you, and you will say thank you and tell me how beautiful the smoke smells. But nothing will be different. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Oh, man. Oh, How's life yeah, treating you? It's frustrating. Life's, life's good. I'm enjoying the sunshine. And yeah. looking forward to to learning some more about you. Um, man, uh, do you mind if I introduce you real quick? Um, Go for it. Yeah. Dr. David McDonald is a preacher. He's a teacher. He's a lecturer in colleges and seminaries all over the world. His work has been featured on the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the and Time Magazine, and David was the first ever, this, this was interesting, post-doctoral fellowship at Portland Seminary, where you teach, I believe, still, right? And um, yeah. you continue to integrate spiritual truth with sharp social analysis as founder of the Fasaurus Chapter House in Jackson, Michigan, where I live. And um, You've been training pastors there and and doing just all kinds of amazing work. And I'm I'm on this this hunt of Dave's around the world um, to just learn about uh, how fascinating Dave's. I'm just another Dave, but you are not just no, another Dave, and have been doing amazing things. And I, I I I'm just glad that you're that you're actually the first Dave I'm interviewing, and you're you're right in my backyard. And I feel like. Uh, a lot of people know you locally and stuff, but you are more well known. It seems like worldwide um, for a lot of different things, and it's it's just uh, an honor to get to to learn a little bit more about you here. Well, thanks, man. It, I, I appreciate that. It's exciting to talk to you and exciting to talk about ministry and all that good stuff. I don't I don't know actually how infamous or how much notoriety I truly have, but it's it's nice to know that somebody's. You know, somebody's believing in the baloney. So thanks, Dave. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, maybe we could start there. Could you could you um, could you share more about your journey as a as a preacher, as a teacher, as a lecturer in college, in colleges and seminaries worldwide? How did you? How did you? Where did this begin? How did you find your calling in this field? Yeah. Well, my dad was a pastor, and so I grew up in church. Uh, I was a church rat running around eating all the communion leftovers and getting in trouble for bringing rats into the sanctuary. Um, so you could say it's in my blood really, but I, but I knew I felt, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a mystic. So I, I really felt strongly that God wanted what God was calling me into, into Christian ministry. When I was in seventh grade, um, I had this really deep certainty um, that when I was in the middle of, of, you know, a random school day, um, that that's what I was meant to do. That's what I was supposed to do. And and along with that, I felt this strong compulsion that sounds terrible. I wish I wish this was not the truth, but in the interest of, of telling the truth, I had this strong compulsion um, that God was calling me to change church. That's just those two simple words, you're going to change the church. And hmm. um, and that really guided me and, 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 and pulled me forward into thinking differently about church and differently about spiritual gatherings, differently about power structures, differently about the integration of, of faith in the marketplace, about the overlap between the church and the world or um, the sacred and the secular. And I mean, I really started doing ministry right away. In seventh grade, I led my first Bible study, me and all my little friends and all the few Christians that were in my elementary school. We, uh, we all started bringing our Bibles to school every day and we started meeting for prayer every afternoon afternoon and um, and so so i kind of had this leadership impulse really early and and despite whatever ignorance i had which seems to persist <laughs> i still started started doing ministry um with whatever i had in front of me and whoever i had around me and then as now it was really fun man it's really fun so i did all kinds of ministry stuff in school in high school and then in college and in college i started working with um athletes as a varsity chaplain for one of the big schools where I was and um, started running all kinds of sports camps, evangelistic sports camps, running basketball, Bible studies and 
doing devotionals for athletes. I, I did a ton of music ministry. I was a drummer. And so I played in all kinds of bands that would do, you know, worship festivals and concerts. And um, I started a, a young adults ministry at the church where I, I was working as an intern. Um, so I was kind of for people 18 to 25, which, which at that time in Canada, that was when people statistically sort of dipped away from faith. So we were trying mm-hmm. to be the last off gap for that and that was super fun and we, we saw lots of great results and that was also when i was in my undergrad running that young adults ministry that was the first time i started teaching at a seminary at pacific life bible college mm-hmm. in in uh, surrey canada but they called me up and they said hey we need, we need somebody to teach on creativity and worship and so i taught there for two or three years and that was my first sort of taste of higher ed which is funny because I didn't even have a BA and I was teaching at a Bible college, which tells mm. you all kinds of things about my narcissistic blindness and about the state of credibility of Bible college education. So, <laughs> that's, so, so since then, I've done a bunch more school. I've taught at a bunch more schools. I've taught all over the world. And I, 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 I really love it. I love I love people with a heart for ministry. And I love thinking differently about church. And um, uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of how I got started. And, and and sort of the, the nuance of it. Yeah. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I've been really enjoying reading Heirs of Eden. I think that's one of your your yeah. latest books. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Thank and you. Uh, I've really, that has been a, a, just a fantastic read. And I, I was surprised. I And I'll put this on the, the show notes, but the, the amount of books you have on uh, Amazon, I think it said 35. Is that right? Well, you know what Ecclesiastes says, right? There's there's many books, but not much wisdom. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Heirs of Eden, I, like, I really like work. I like working. I li- I'm he- healthiest when I'm busy. I enjoy putting my mind to things. I love special projects. Now, I'm I'm from a family, and I'm currently in a family of of workaholics. So I'm the mm-hmm. laziest person with that has my last name, <laughs> whether it's my family wow. of origin. Or the family I have now, I am just really working to keep up because they're all going to do stuff, and and I'm the one that gets left behind in the dust. So, so I've really come to find ways to make work pleasurable. Like I love what I do. I've always loved what I do, but I'm loving it the most now. And uh, and so, Heirs of Eden was is really like an homage to godly work, how to love your work. But I realized after I published it that nobody else loves their job, and so. <laughs> So a lot of people mm. who read the book uh, uh, find it s- sort of daunting because I use the word work over and over and over again. I talk mm. about the holiness of work, the sanctity of work, the joys of work, the pleasure of work. And uh, a friend of mine said to me, he goes, man, I, every time I read your book, I just feel guilty for hating my job. I was like, okay, that's a blind spot that I had. I, I think if I could do it all over again, I would have written it using the metaphor of play instead of the metaphor of work. Uh, and then yeah. because because for me, they overlap. Like right, you right. play and play at the same time, man. You you glorify God with what you do. You you enjoy the people that you're with. You pour yourself with passion and intensity to everything you do. And and I think the biblical word for that is work, but the cultural word for that is play. So I uh, mm. I had a a wave of magic wand maybe that reveal yeah that's that's interesting um and it you know it might show kind of an extraordinary privilege that that you have i also have it myself i i really get to enjoy uh kind of a i feel like i'm playing uh in, in my work world even though it's quite a bit different than yours kind of um i i'm a lot like uh an an editor for a book kind of uh for yeah, yeah. well courses essentially and um i i find myself extraordinarily privileged also in in those regards where at the same time you know there's this you, you want to point people to that biblical um I mean, it even talks about it in Ecclesiastes, uh, the, the the meaning that we find in our work. Um, yeah. And it uses the word work, not the word play. <laughs> but yeah. there is there is sort of like a, a need for our work to be playful, um, for it to, to be. Yeah. So that's really interesting, like feedback. That, that's actually the next question I was going to get to. Um, was like, how do you feel your unique perspective integrates 
spiritual truth, with sharp social analysis, and how how has your work been received by a, a broader audience? Would you say? Yeah, well, it's it's tricky for me to try and ascertain what my unique perspective is. I think I think I just have a built-in BS detector, and I don't. I just yeah. don't like when people tell me how things are supposed to go and they don't go that way. And yet the people telling me this is how it's supposed to go, double down on it. You know, uh, like, for example, when they tell me that Christian people are supposed to dress or act a certain way or that pastors are supposed to behave a certain way and that holiness looks this particular way or that particular way. And I go, I've been around too many Christians and too many pastors to know that those facades are, mm. are, are really misleading. Mm. Um, so, so I have, I'm like, I'm hugely pragmatic. I go, if it doesn't work and if it doesn't feel true and if it doesn't feel beautiful, then I don't want anything to do with it. Mm. And I don't want you to put it on me and I want you to put it on anybody else. I just, I'm going to sit there and go, this is bullshit, man. What are we doing? Why are we lying to ourselves about this? Mm. Um, so if I have a unique perspective, it's that I'm, just going to be a bit skeptical about anybody who says they have a unique perspective. So, <laughs> so in that, in that, that way, I guess I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm a poster child for Gen X and Kurt Cobain is my president and all that good stuff, you know? Um, and in terms of how people uh, receive me, you know, I, I tend to be quite polarizing, which is always mm. so mystical or mystifying rather, because I really enjoy people. I love people, even people I don't agree with. I still enjoy their company. Mm. I have a natural affinity and, and affection for, for just other humans. Um, but my, my, uh, tendency to call bs really offends some people you know they they mm -hmm. get really um put off by it or they get really defensive of it or they get really nervous that i'm going to call bs on them mm -hmm. um and and i try and be really aware of that i'm not i'm not always so good at that i mean i, I have some I have some pretty big blind spots that i would love to be able to see past but i think that's why we call them blind spots is because you can't always do it mm -hmm. uh, so i'm trying i'm working on shrinking them but um so so mm -hmm. people tend to either uh, be really drawn towards my authenticity or they they're really um they really sneer at it uh for fear that it's going to be weaponized mm. i think that's fair so as the founder of the chapter house um do you typically call it just just the chap chapter house or also, also the thesaurus chapter house? We usually call it just the chapter house because no one can say thesaurus. So <laughs> you're doing a great job. You're, you're, you're a world leader of pronouncing an unpronounceable word. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so usually we just call it the chapter house because because uh, then nobody feels dumb. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, maybe could you elaborate on the mission and the purpose of this initiative and particularly in... Train, uh, training creative pastors and how does it yeah. contribute to the integration of spirituality and creativity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so typically the resources that are available for pastors are are like um, uh, they're therapeutic resources. You know, pastors are discouraged, pastors are frustrated, pastors are sad, pastors don't have support systems. So, when people try and minister to, to pastors, they, they're ministering to what I think of as the sad pastor. It's like a sad pastor initiative. And they think that what pastors need is time alone to pray or quiet time, time to reflect, time to heal. And it's not that pastors don't need that, but I'm always surprised at the assumption that we don't pray in our normal lives. Like I don't need to go away onto a retreat to pray. Like that's what, like, that's what I do as a Christian. A pastor is not, not a Christian. Like how, where did we get this idea? It's just mm -hmm. sort of goofy. Um, so I always think that the great majority of pastoral support resources to which I've been exposed, they, they always aim low. You know, it's like a triage mm -hmm. saying, Hey, you're not doing so good. Come on here. Daddy will give you a hug and a band aid, and we'll get you a cookie and send you back out there. Um, and in my 30 years of pastoral ministry and growing up around my dad, I just thought those things were never effective. Not at all. Um, so instead I wanted the chapter house to be something that enlivens the dreams of pastors, mm -hmm. uh, particularly, Teachers, leaders, and innovators. I just want to like, like instead of aiming low, I want to aim really high and find out like what's the book you've always wanted to write that you never had a chance to. What's the initiative you always wanted to start that you can never quite seem to get around to? What are the forgotten dreams, sort of the glowing embers deep inside your spirit that that real ministry has kind of kicked the the crap out of and and sort of dampened. And you need somebody to, to get some oxygen and some gasoline on that sucker so your heart explodes and you, you're a believer born again all over again. 
So mm. that's really what the, the chapter house is for. And it's sort of with this sad pastor initiative, the other thing that, that often happens is people will look at pastors and they think, um, well, we don't want them to get proud or we don't want them to be, uh, you know, preachers with sneakers or that kind of thing. And so they give pastors like garbage, absolute leftover garbage. And I was the recipient of a lot of garbage, as was my father. And I remember one time somebody offering my dad um, oh, a quiet weekend away at a cabin in the woods. And so my dad said, hey, Dave, why don't, why don't you come with me? And, you know, they, they build it as this really deluxe experience. So we go to this cabin in the woods and it's like a dirty, musty old shack with, you know, one light bulb and some mold on a mattress and there's some pb and j in the cover and a, in the cupboard and a loaf of, of white bread and i look i look watch my dad as he's sort of taking all this in and this is a godly self-sacrificing man who never really made much money doing ministry who gave tirelessly of himself for his whole life and i'm looking at this beautiful man try not to feel insulted and degraded and demeaned but he was it was. And and that's how people tend to treat pastors, because they're afraid that pastors have a secret 747 or a gold mansion or somewhere. And it's ridiculous that the, the vast majority of pastors are struggling to make ends meet. They take hardly any money, making far less than your average you know, elementary school teacher or gym teacher. I mean, they're just they're not wealthy. So one of the things I wanted to do with the, with the check house is spoil them, give them great food and great accommodations and, and treat them mm. to great books and resources so that they come into this environment that's kind of like somewhere between a monastery and a museum on crack, you know, and they, they get to experience <laughs> all wonderful things here from the richness of Christian history and tradition and, and feel absolutely like somebody loves them and has taken care of them. So that's that's the chapter house. And the, those two things, enlivening their dreams, <clears throat> pardon me, and, and spoiling and delighting their senses, um, generate a tremendous amount of creative energy. Um, I mean, people just come alive as soon as they get into the house. Mm. The ideas start flowing and people start riffing. And we have kind of a no-holds-barred approach to Bible study and, and conversation. And so, so there's this sort of crackling intensity to all our conversations. And people come back to life here man and it's awesome it's awesome to see it's so cool that's amazing and you've been you've been doing this for about five years is it yeah we just had our five-year anniversary from when we opened and then and then i've been here full-time two years two years uh since thursday oh, um right so that, yeah. that's yeah that's pretty cool i i left i left local church ministry to become a, a missionary that's what we call it. we call it uh, we say i'm a missionary because i don't make any money so if I, so but i also like to say i'm unemployed but that's not true I, I just <laughs> yeah. so your book the the heirs of eden uh I told you i'm reading um emphasizes the idea of integrating one's God-given dreams, like you were talking about with life as a Christian. Can you delve into how individuals can navigate the tension between pursuing personal dreams and aligning with religious values or expectations? Sure. Well, yeah, well, that the second half of that is uh, sort of a loaded question because it really depends on what your religious expectation, tradition, and values are. Because even within Christianity, there's a huge range. And even within evangelicalism, there's a huge range. So let's start with the first part. I think the dreams that you have are the dreams that God has given you. Like the little secret desires of your heart, the, the things you've always wanted to do, the pet projects, the wonderments, the amusements that keep you awake at night. Those things are peculiar to you. Like I guarantee every day on the planet has different dreams. And those dreams uh, are, are like little breadcrumbs that God lays out ahead of us to say, if you follow this dream, the process of following this dream will challenge you, will develop you, will grow you, will make you stronger, will make you more shrewd, will make you sharper, will bring new people into your life. Because as you chase this dream that I've given you, you're going to grow into the best possible version of yourself. So the dream is like bait. Is how God gets what God wants in you, which is a better you, a holier, more complex, more beautiful more, more, you, uh, a you that's completely alive. That's not just you know satisfied with a nine to five job and 
you know, 2.5 kids and a corgi or something. I mean, no, this is the you that's going balls to the wall living um, the way our creator intended. So that, that's the dream. And that comes into sharp conflict with almost all religious values in America. Um, I mean, re really, Christianity, by and large, has, has lost the spirit of our founder. I mean, if Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, if he's the Alpha and the Omega, if he's the source and sustenance of human becoming, if 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 he's everything, then then we ought to be anchored and centered in on Jesus. And Jesus would make a terrible American Christian. Jesus is breaking <laughs> taboos all of the time. Jesus is giving the appearance that he's a party animal and a drunk, that he's carousing with women and sinful people. So J Jesus is going to get preached at in every pulpit in America. Because, because he's not hanging out with Christian people, because he's given the appearance of evil, because he's flouting himself at conventions and, and, and taboos and playing fast and loose with the rules like he's going to get away with something. And these are all the things that American Christians of every stripe are really, really, really worried about. We have a, a holiness fetish failing to realize that our definition of holiness is not the definition of Jesus. It's the definition of the Pharisees. We're so afraid of sinning. We put up barrier after barrier after barrier so that if we happen to transgress one barrier, at least we won't transgress the next one, which is still three barriers away from what the scripture actually refers to as sin. And we're so worried uh, that, that, that we might be something less than morally perfect that we've forgotten about what it means to be Christ-like. Um, we, we have become the church that leaves the one to search after the 99. And it's heartbreaking. And, and so when I say follow your dreams, you know what? If you're going to follow your dreams, it's going to press you. It's going to test you. It will punish you in ways. It will cost you. So, yeah, you might say a bad word. Yeah, your life might fall out of rhythm. You might not Sabbath really well all of the time. Yeah, you know what? You might not always be able to perfectly tithe if you follow your dreams. But guess what? You won't be neutered. You'll be the person God has called you to become. Mm. You will live fully and gloriously alive in the image and likeness of your creator. You'll live like Jesus, who, let's not forget, living the way he lived, made him a ton of enemies, mostly from the religious people who ultimately killed them. So, yeah, following your dreams is amazing, but it's going to tick some people off and it's going to cost you. But it would be worth it, man. Worth it. Yeah. Preach it. I love this. Wow. Um, so in the book, you mentioned the concept of manifesting manifesting the spirit of God within oneself simply by being authentic. So how do you envision this authenticity playing out in various professions and lifestyles from woodworking to investment banking? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, boy, when you read that sentence back to me, it sounds so uh, so new agey. But <laughs> maybe I better provide some caveats, you know. But really, what I mean is that, uh, like, the most godly thing you can do is be yourself, right? I mean, in, in the providence of God, God made one you, and God doesn't want you to become a cookie cutter version of anybody else. God wants you to embrace your own picadillos, your personality quirks, your interests. You know, you, you want to dye your hair, dye your hair. Uh, you want to wear tight fitting clothes or loose fitting clothes. You wear them. Th these, these things, these, these affectations make life interesting and beautiful. And uh, I mean, just imagine God looking down at over all of humanity and the, the, imagine the tragedy if God couldn't tell us all apart because we're so committed to, uh, cloning ourselves into others that <laughs> remove all our distinctiveness. So, so mm. when I think about how we manifest the glory of God or how we demonstrate the truth of God's uh, image and imprint upon us, I think, well, be yourself for starters. Um, you know, uh, uh, unless you're going to hurt somebody, then, then clearly there's, there's something wrong with yourself and knock it off. But I mean, you know, <laughs> so long it doesn't hurt anybody, be yourself. Be yourself, which means you got to have a commitment to telling the truth. You know, when, when somebody asks you if you want to do something and you don't want to do it, say, no, I don't want to do that. Instead of all the little white Christian lies we love to tell, um, you know, be, be committed to making bold assertions. I think this because, you know, stand up for something. Um, and mm. and one of the things I think is so critical is if, is if we can learn to stand for things, not against them. I mean, Christians are such issue pickers um but if you gotta live for something li live with an orientation toward blessing 
and healing towards self-sacrifice, not the control of others. Don't, don't work for cultural change and completely ignore personal change. Um, mm -hmm. Be salt and light. And so, so when I talk to people about their jobs, I say, you know, Im imagine that you're like, a, you know, an incense diffuser. You know, when you come into the workplace, you, you ought to, you ought to give off a, a pleasing aroma of fragrance, or you know how some, sometimes you, you know, a campfire gathers people together. Uh, a candle in a dark room brings people together. We all get to enjoy the the light and the heat together. And the, the, you don't need to evangelize everybody. You don't need to proselytize everybody. You don't even need to have a, a mind towards witnessing. And it's not that I want to uh, argue that any of those things are unbiblical. They're all very biblical. But our current cultural um, assumptions about how those things work are, are really unhelpful and ineffective. Every Christian I know that's out there to be a witness is a terrible witness. Every Christian <laughs> I know that saves souls um, does more harm than good be because mm. we've, we've lost the plot. We've lost the thread. So instead, if you want to be a witness, if you want to evangelize, don't think about witnessing and evangelizing because you're going to do a bunch of things that are not going to be helpful. Instead, think about blessing and healing. Mm -hmm. how, how can I, how can I, and, and sometimes people say, well, yeah, that's right. We're just supposed to love everybody. I go, well, no, here's the trick. When you, when you say the word love, you mean I get to lovingly tell you what your sins are because I love you so much. I won't let you go to hell uh, but because of all the nonsense you're involved in. This is so damning and so damaging and so counterproductive and so unlike Jesus. So instead think about blessing and blessing in the Bible is, uh, it's like, it's like it's like you're calling God's attention on something that's already good, you know. So if I see somebody in the park, you know, playing with their kids, um, that's good. And so I might bless them by saying, "Man, I love the way you're interacting with your family. That's so cool. God bless you mm -hmm. for doing that. That's really neat." And then they're going to feel great and they're going to feel affirmed. And the next time they play with their kids, they're going to realize this is this is something good that's happening. And wow. uh, and the likelihood that I'm going to start a relationship or a friendship with a person on that foot is so much better and so much healthier than if I go, oh man, your kids at the swings. Uh, sure hope they don't fall and die because they'd burn in hell for eternity. I just love you enough to tell you the truth about that, brother. It's like, what, where, where does this come from? This, this sort of evangelistic pathology it was, it was disturbing. Anyway, sorry. I've had a lot oh. of coffee. and <laughs> That's, uh, it really rings true a lot because um, my, my wife, Lindsay, was was home with our kids uh, early on. And man, you know, all the, the challenges that um, a mother experiences in, in that work, because it's work, um, like crazy work. And um, she had one person at a park actually uh, say something to the effect of like, you are you are an amazing mom and just spoke blessing and, and truth oh that's her. awesome and just like yeah. how much that did for her for so yeah. many years really it's just power. yeah oh that's cool that i was so terrified you were going to tell a bad story i was like please tell me no one came up to your wife and told her that she was going to hell at the park please please God. <laughs> i picked a, i picked a really hyperbolic extremity please tell me that it didn't happen well there there are some bad ones but i i'm not going to share those but uh, <laughs> well good good good, good. uninteresting <laughs> uh, but uh so you discuss this uh theology i love this theology of creativity um could you share your insights on how creativity is not limited to traditional notions of ministry but extends to diverse fields and activities yeah, I mean, in, in the very first chapter of our Bible, God is introduced to us as a creator. Like the, the creativity flows from God. Creativity is a manifestation of God'sness. I mean, and you can't you can't create apart from the creator. And when God creates creation, God places little co-creators inside of creation. So I think it was N.T. Wright, it might have been Scott McNeil, but I think it was N.T. Wright who first coined the phrase, the creator created creators to perpetuate creation. So, so from day one, we're made by God to be like God, and God is first creative. So we're involved in this work of creativity, which I, I think is best broken down into the work of fixing and making. I mean, some creative work is, is recognizing, hey, we got a problem and we need to fix it. That's going to require some ingenuity, maybe some innovative solutions. That And some creative work is just sort of making stuff up. Uh, art, poetry, 
architecture, uh, mathematics. I mean, there, there's any number of manifestations of the creative impulse um, in human being. And that's how we fill the earth and subdue it. That's how we exercise dominion um, over the creatures of, of the world and over the non-human inhabitants. Um, and, and, and so, like, everything you do has creativity embedded in it, whether we acknowledge it or not. And typically, when people hear creativity, they tend to assume that what we're talking about is art. You know, like, oh, I'm not very creative is a synonym for I don't paint. Um, but, but, but there's business creativity, right? That's innovation, putting creativity to work. There's, there's mathematical creativity. There, there's, um, creativity in fitness. I mean, basketball players are creative. A great quarterback is creative. Rugby players are phenomenally creative. I mean, gymnasts, I mean, we're, we're, we are creating all of the time. Every time that we make up something that wasn't there before, we're, we're creating, we're creating activities to do with our children. We're cre creating new strategies for productivity at work and, um, and all of that stuff is is an emulation of God. It's a revelation of God's character and a participation in the life of God and God's spirit. Uh, that's why in, in I think it's First Peter, maybe it's Second Peter, but Peter refers to us as participants in the divine nature. I mean, we get caught up in who God is and what God does, and who is God? He's creator, and what does God do? He creates. Um, and so we, when we create, we're caught up in in that divine nature too. Love that. Um, so you differentiate between creativity and art artistry. Can you speak of the role of artist or, or artistic reflections on God's plan of restoration in the world? Um, so how does yeah. this contribute to a deeper understanding of humanity's true purpose? Well, so I'm I'm very pro art. I always have to I always have to pro, pro artist is probably a better way to say it. But I always have to curb my comments about art to sort of broaden them to include creativity because there's so few artists. But the the great contribution of genuine artists is I think an exposure and a a combat of ugliness. Um, I think the thing that makes Christian art so often so insipid is that it's it's got this kind of Pollyanna quality to it. You know, it's pastels and and lighthouses and it's all cutesy woogie and it, and and that's not the human experience at all. So real artists are going to show you ugliness and darkness and conflict and frustration. Real artists are going to highlight transformation, victory, and overcoming. Re real artists are going to are going to uh, break boundaries and 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 explore taboos. And I think we see a lot of real artistry in the prophetic tradition. You think about uh, Elijah. No, pardon, was it Elijah? No, pardon me, Ezekiel. Ezekiel laying on his side and cutting off his beard and burning off parts of his hair. Ezekiel feels like the kind of performance artist you'd see on the street corner in San Francisco. I mean, he's making a public spectacle of himself. He's the art uh, to deliver this prophetic, provocative message. And so I think, I think the gift of the arts to the church is provocation. And the problem is that the church has made art into therapy, which it can be, um, but, but not especially effectively. Um, and so, so the more we give artists their head, the more we give them their lead, the more we, we allow them to poke at us, even when it makes us uncomfortable, the healthier the church is, and the more valued and honored the artistic profession is. Mm -hmm. Got to chew on that one. It's, po it's possible I didn't answer your question. I'm sorry. I, I, no, no, you did. <laughs> um if I get a score for being a good listener at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> so you emphasize that the um, Heirs of Eden book is for individuals with various passions and professions. Could you share some examples or stories from your experiences that highlight the universal un universality of the message of Heirs of Eden? Uh, yeah, um, I think well, one one in particular group that I wrote it in mind was for um, um, entrepreneurs. Um, so I think about people like my friend Scott or my friend Jason, my, uh, my other friend uh, Jason or John, particular people in my mind that I'm thinking of who wonder if God is involved in their work. 
And so a big part of Heirs of Eden is me going, you who work in web development and you who work as an electrician and you who are a business entrepreneur and you who are a restaurateur and you who run a pest control company, this is why I think God is involved in your work. Um, and, and, and at varying levels, that's been very meaningful to them. Um, you know, sometimes I get a bit eggheady and a bit geeky and there's a little too much Bible in there for, you know, Joe Blow. Um, but, but certainly the warp and woof of the book has been very, very meaningful to those guys just to know that, yeah, your, your work, no matter what it is, you know, whether you're a pediatric nurse or a garbage man, your work matters to God and everything you do can be saturated with the spirit. So oh, that's wonderful. So last question here, how, how uh, essentially do you hope then that uh, Heirs of Eden or maybe your other books uh, will impact readers and their perspectives on work, faith, and art, and what outcomes or transformations do you envision for those who engage with the book? Yeah, if, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and get one thing, I would, would remove the worry the obligation and the fear of Christian living from Christian people. Mm. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundant. But somehow we hear Jesus saying, there's a bunch of secret rules that you've probably already broken and I'm really mad. <laughs> and so we sort of go through life with this heaviness to us where we're not sure what we should do. We're not sure if we're allowed to want anything. We're afraid we've screwed something up already, and we think God's always mad at us. And if I could wave a magic wand, I would say, don't worry, man. Just let the Spirit of God lead you and pull you forward. God has more for you. God wants to do more with you. God enjoys you. God made you. And the more you, you become, the, the more sanctified you become which which i define not only as becoming pure but more purely the person god made you to be i mean the more the more you're refined and beautified and glorified the more god gets glory so don't worry about the stick so much and just run after the carrot mm -hmm. dr david mcdonald thank you uh, this has been a pleasure and i look forward to uh Hopefully being able to engage uh, here and there more with uh, Chapter House and hearing more about what you're doing. I just love it. It's good stuff. And uh, I hope more and more people, uh, especially in Jackson area, uh, realize what we have in your ministry of the Chapter House. So thank you. Hey, thanks, brother. I appreciate it, man. Cheers. <laughs>